thank you dr knapoli and uh, also thank you the organizers of the iska for inviting me for this uh, great opportunity to give my uh, talk about my research i'll be very brief in this because uh, uh, the very short time and uh, i am compiling all my career kind of a what where we started doing the research and uh, where we are today uh, so the fundamental issue that we you guys must have heard today is uh, the aggregation of platelets to form the thrombus so the question comes if the platelets are in the circulation why they don't clump by themselves why they only clump when there is a injury to form the thrombus the reason is it has on the surface integrin a molecule which is the surface uh, receptor for fibrinogen and this has to be activated in order to bind fibrinogen and that is what is shown here in this slide is the integrin alpha 2b beta 3 and it's in the bent conformation on the surface of the platelets so the ligand binding site is here which is very close to the membrane so the ligand cannot bind what it needs is to activate this to make it upright and then the thrombus binds uh, the fibrinogen binds at this point here and now the as the fibrinogen binds it can induce signals inside the platelet and that's what causes the platelet thrombus formation and the stability of the thrombus so 25 years ago we started thinking about this what is going on here at the tails of this integrin that keeps the integrin in an inactive conformation and when needed during injury how it is activated and then how that induces the signal in order to form the thrombus so the main receptor on the uh, platelet surface is integrin alpha to be beta 3 and what i show you today little bit of uh, work that we have done in the past 10 years or so in which we identified a protein called jam a it is junctional adhesion molecule a and it binds and inhibits the integrin so it keeps the integrin in unactivated conformation that's why we we don't get clot all over the body when we are normal however if there is an injury and when we need the platelets to clump that time this jam a is removed and then the integrin binds to another protein that we cloned about uh, 15 years ago and it is called as calcium and integrin binding protein and it binds and then it binds to another protein activates the integrin called ASP1 up after the signal regulating kinase and that's why you get the aggregation of the platelets and that's what I'm going to show you in my remaining slides how these things whole thing works so going first to what is JAMA JAMA is a transmembrane protein with the IG domains and it is present on the surface of the platelets it binds integrin and keeps the integrin in active state how do we know this so what we did is we generated a knockout mouse where we have a wild type mouse that makes JAMA and a knockout mouse doesn't make JAMA and then we asked how in these two mice the thrombus formation occurs so I'll show you this uh, in the left hand side uh, there is the wild type mouse and the right hand side is the jamme knockout and what the platelets are green so they show the thrombus formation and see what happens is in the knock wild type mice there is very little thrombus formation that's what we want whereas in the jamme is not there then there is uncontrolled thrombus formation the thrombus formation continues so this is what told us how uh, JAMA is functioning. What is the function of JAMA in platelets? Is to control the size of thrombus growth. And uh, if you don't have JAMA, then you, you have an uncontrolled thrombus growing. Okay, 
So we wanted to go a little in the mechanism how Jamie functions and how it keeps the integrin in unactivated state. So first we show that the integrin when it is activated, it requires it requires the phosphorylation and you can see here in the wild type mice, you get phosphorylation but in the knockout mouse, the phosphorylation is much more. So that is how JAMI blocks integrin activation. So the phosphorylation is caused by SARC family kinases. So we looked at the SARC family kinase. If you use the inhibitor, you can see that it, wild type JAMI, uh, that is the aggregation. If JAMI is not there, there is more aggregation. And if you block SARC, then there is no difference, it is less aggregation and there is no difference. So we know it is because of the SARC family kinase. Now how is the SARC family kinase is activated? We show here, if the SARC family kinase is bound to a CSK, another kinase that phosphorylates this SARC and keeps it inactive. When CSK is lost, you get active SARC kinase. So what we show here, is that integrin alpha, integrin alpha 2 beta 3 is bound to JAME, which we can show that by uh, immunoprecipitation. When platelets are activated, this association is lost. And as a result, it, JAME also associates with CSK, and that association is also lost when it is activated. So this told us that JAME brings CSK to the SARC and keeps it inactive. And if JAME is not there, SARC remains active and that's why you get more aggregation. So if this is correct, then in knockout mouse, the CSK should not be associated with integrin. And that's what we show here, the CSK is not associated with the integrin. It's completely lost. So the model of our here is if the integrin and JAME is together in a resting state, when platelets are activated, JAME separates out, CSK is lost, and integrin can activate now. So that is what we, we shown. So moving next, the once JAME's association is removed from, uh, uh, inhibition is removed, so a protein called Calcium and integrin binding protein, the name suggests it binds integrin and it is a calcium binding protein. We solved its crystal structure and you can see here that when you generated a knockout mouse of CYP1, you get unstable thrombus formation. So CYP1 is needed for stable thrombus formation. If CYP1 is not there, you get unstable thrombus formation. And this is in vivo thrombosis model. So we next looked at what happens if CYP1 is not there. If you look at the individual platelets, if the wild type platelet where CYP1 is there, the platelet spread very nicely. In the knockout, the platelet don't spread. They remain spiky, but they don't spread. So CYP1 is needed for the platelet to spread and form thrombus. So CYP1, how do we know that CYP1 is needed for the thrombus formation and platelet spreading? So if you look at the platelets, in a human platelet, this is unactivated platelet, very small. When they are activated, they form spiky and this red color is CYP1 protein. So CYP1 protein is right at the tip of these finger-like projections. And then the platelet spread and the CYP1 is all around. So we able to introduce inhibitor of CYP1 in platelets and that is an anti-CYP1 antibody. This blocks CYP1 from binding to the integrin and you can see that if you introduce this then you get spiky platelets but they don't spread. And this is what makes, uh, the, we found out that it is how the CYP1 is blocking the platelet spreading, uh, helping platelet spreading. Okay, so CYP1, so with the next question is what is this calcium binding protein do? 
so it binds to another kinase called CSK1 or ASK1. So here is the structure of ASK1, it is the kinase domain, it binds paradoxin and it is uh, 165 kilo Dalton. So what AS ASK1 is, a MAP kinase cascade, is the, this is ASK1, it is called a MAP kinase 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 that phosphorylates MAP kinase kinase and then that, that one then phosphorylates MAP kinase with the P38. So, in unactivated platelet, the ASK1 is, is not phosphorylated, but in the, within 30 seconds, ASK1 gets phosphorylated. And so that is the indication that it is getting activated. So we looked at ASK1 knockout mouse. So we generated ASK1 knockout mouse, and then we showed that if you make an injury with fatty chloride, you can see that again you get an unstable thrombus formation. So this is CIB1 and downstream is the ASK1. So we also performed another thrombosis assay and this is called thromboembolism assay in which we inject the collagen and epinephrine in the mice and we see the wild type mice die within two minutes because of the thrombus formation and blocking their uh, uh, respiratory system in the lungs. Now, whereas if you don't have ASK1, then most of the 80% of the mice survive. So this is the indication that it is a uh, blocking the thrombo, it is involved in thrombosis. So what does the ASK1 do? So if you have a wild type, you get a P38 phosphorylation, that means ASK1 is there, and it phosphorylates P38. If ASK1 is not there, P38 MAP kinase is not phosphorylated at all. So this is telling us that that cascade of MAP kinase is important for thrombus formation. So what do I showed you so far is integrin, the major receptor most important for thrombus formation, and it is kept in check or it is kept in inactive state by JAMA. But when the agonist induced, JAMA is lost. And now the integrin is activated. It, it activates CIB1, and then CIB1 activates ASK1, and ASK1 then causes aggregation. So once we know all these players, there are important players in the pathway, what we can do is we can generate inhibitors of each of these so that we can block thrombosis. So what do I show here is the imaginary function of JAMA. It's a JAMA is like this elephant carrying this on the middle of the highway. So it is not blocking the highway, but it is just suppressing the traffic. So that is what you see all the time in your, uh, and the CSAR is something like this, which is ducking from the this, this is where I will stop.